you know, straw verging on pale yellow with a little bit of um, green and silver highlight, you know, we don't, um, just to remind us all, we don't, um, you know, blast through the visual as something we have to get through, especially in deductive tasting. It can be essential, uh, particularly if you get to your initial conclusion and you're wide-eyed and baffled. So that said, when um, we're addressing um, the attributes, uh, fruit, uh, floral and such, just remember that we're talking uh, about both uh, aromatics and palate and finish and mouthfeel. So um, especially aromatically, what I get on this wine instantly is this beautiful, bright citrus character, like ripe lemon, not so much sweet like Meyer lemon, but, uh, but just ripe lemon. And on the palate, there's a little bit of peel and zest, a little teeny little bit of um, a phenolic character, though it doesn't um, dominate. Um, in terms of tree fruit, absolutely tart green, green apple, green pear. Um, you know, I'm not getting a whole lot of stone fruit in this at the moment, maybe a little bit of uh, nectarine um, on the nose, but flip on down to um, uh, floral. There's a beautiful, uh, mild, but distinct lime and lemon blossom category uh, character to this wine and apple blossom. So, <clears throat> you know, uh, lemony citrus uh, dominates with a little uh, tart uh, tree fruit and um, a beautiful, I would say fresh, not dried, uh, blossom characteristic on the nose. Then we can go to the next panel. I'm taking another sip because I like this so much. We're going to get to the uh, mouthfeel in a moment, but really hold the thought on the, the, the characteristic of the acidity in this wine because it's uh, definitely a thumbprint. Uh, in terms of vegetable or herbal characteristics, there's a little bit of a green element, maybe olive green, but it doesn't pull my attention at this tasting. However, if you look down at the herbal, again, tart herbs, lemongrass, sorrel, verbena, chervil, you know, that sort of um, follows through and is true and honest with both um, citrus fruit and uh, the florality of the wine. Um, if you go down to inorganic earth, boy, you know, I thought I smelled it and I sure can taste it. Whether you want to define it as, you know, salinity, that beautiful seashell character or wet rocks, it's in there. You know, it's, um, it's not just simple fruit. It's intermixed with inorganic earth. Uh, Zippo oak aging, or they're really fooling the hell out of me. And in terms of, um, Perceived winemaking choices, I would say probable least contact because of the richness of the wine when I hold it on my palate. And that, by the way, is a personal trick. I often, on the second taste especially, will hold the wine on my palate for two reasons. To really get a sense of the mouthfeel, but also to get a plumb line of flavor mid-palate, which I don't get otherwise. Then moving on to the structure, absolutely dry the acidity. Medium plus, I would say if you were to call it high, it's definitely though um, not a compelling tart razor sharp acidity. It's integrated and it is mouth watering, uh, but it doesn't shut down the other aspects of the wine. Alcohol is balanced, I would say medium at this tasting. They're saying no phenols. I think there's possibly a whisper, but you know, nothing worth um, uh, really focusing on. Texture, lean and tart is the short, simple version, but there's a lushness to the fruit of this wine. Um, the finish is medium plus verging on long. And I think this wine absolutely has complexity and will probably pick some more up with a teeny little bit more bottle age. Though, you know, it's drinking very well, fresh and young. So short version, unoaked, um, white, with uh, beautiful citrus fruit, a florality, and a strong inorganic minerality, and uh, you know, compelling acidity. So, which grape variety? You know, there are three very distinct characteristics to these wines: Riesling and Verdicchio. Can you still hear me nicely? Yep, absolutely. Oh, good. Riesling and Verdicchio. This is where the acidity comes into play on both of those wines. But remember, Riesling is a highly aromatic variety, and Verdicchio. I would say is, if not non-aromatic, semi-aromatic. So hold that thought. Pinot Grigio, yes, can be 
unoaked and mineral driven, but the mouthfeel tends to be softer, fatter, um, and a little bit of a different fruit expression. So those are my 10 cents. And if you flip down to the regions, Riesling, Germany, Old World, Italy, Verdicchio, New World, um, Chile, or New Zealand, uh, which I imagine we're speaking to both Riesling and Pinot Gris in that respect. So that said, do we, is our, is our poll completely, Mang? Yeah, so we have folks um, still entering, still looks like people are still pondering. So I'll give it mm -hmm. just another 10 seconds mm -hmm. and give um, Maddie, if you had a parting shot of, mm -hmm. you know, or really for those of you who are out there with other, what other are you actually thinking that it could be? Mm -hmm. um, and the, the one thing I will say parting shot, Lee Mang, is please don't uh, have a panic attack because we're asking you to, you know, um, uh, consider Verdicchio in a blind tasting. Consider it in its larger scheme as an Italian varietal that is presenting itself in an unoaked um, uh, mineral driven um, manifestation, if it is indeed that. You know, it can be useful in a tasting like this when you are deducing and trying to eliminate the other grape varieties, aka Pinot Grigio and Riesling. So look at it that way. Great. No kind so of I'm going to share the results. You guys can see that. Uh, folks really thought that it was Verdicchio, and I think it'd be great to uh, explain a little bit more as we talk about the wines. Um, but in terms of where it's grown, uh, where things are grown here, we've got everything from a, a high number, 54% on Italy, but we've got Germany and Chile and even New Zealand in the mix here. So let's see where we end up. Okay, so drum roll, where are we in the world? Uh, yay, Google Earth. And we are taking a trip to, come on, here we go. We are in Europe. We are in uh, mm -hmm. Eastern Italy. We are um, in the province called uh, the Marche, right? That is nestled um, uh, between Emilia Romagna and Abruzzo. And uh, Verdicchio is the grape variety. The particular appellation here is Verdicchio de Castelli di Jesi or Jesi Classico Superiore, a hell of a mouthful. Classico referring to the heart of the district, Superiore referring to a slightly more elevated alcohol level. And there is another appellation of Verdicchio that you're undoubtedly familiar with, Di Matelica, which is more inland. It's a smaller production at higher altitudes. So. Um, Castelli di Gesi is literally 20 miles from the Adriatic. Um, you're still at, you know, you've got some altitude going on here. I think we're around uh, 400, um, uh, oh, here we go, Four, up to 400 meters above sea level, not inconsequential. This is a grape variety and it's 100% Verdicchio. Um, this is a grape variety that ripens a little late. And uh, interestingly, um, this particular producer, Garofoli, I hope I pronounced it, pronounced it correctly, does use slightly late, har late harvested grapes to give the wine a little bit more body um, and acidity. This is a very old grape variety that actually is, if you look it up uh, in Jancis Robinson's Tome on Grapes, synonymous with, wait for it, Trebbiano di Suave aka also Lugana. Uh, and you can find it in other provinces as well, but it really sings as one of the finest white grapes in Italy um, in the market. No oak here, no mallow, uh, which we can deduce by the way it's, uh, it's tasting. Concrete stainless steel uh, tanks, um, you know, about half a year uh, aging before it's released. Family owned and operated estate that actually started as, um, a family that had an inn, and here they are, the Garofoli family, that's now run by, I think, the fifth generation, two brothers, one on the left, one in the center, and their kids and their wives. Um, their grandfather, great-grandfather, uh, had an inn in this area to um, take care of the uh, pilgrim's thirst. I do want to point out, everybody, the, the difference in color between wine one and wine two. Mm. So wine one, you know, the Verdicchio, definitely some skin contact, yeah? Because it's actually got kind of a brassy secondary color as compared to wine number two, which has the lightest color of all the three white wines. 
anyway, just to point that out. So uh, going through the grid, everybody, if you're keeping score, uh, definitely star bright reflects a lot of light. It is clear, the color depth is medium. And I would say, yes, it is straw with green and maybe a little silver. Uh, so maybe that green could perhaps uh, mean youth or grapes in a cool climate. We'll see. And then on the nose, <laughs> okay, on the nose, I'm assaulted by something, but I'm going to take it and I'm going to put it over here so I can get to the rest of everything on the grid. So the wine has actually got quite a bit, a wide range of different kinds of fruit, fruit uh, families and fruits. So yes, I think there's predominantly it's citrus and stone fruit. Uh, lime and key lime are the first thing that comes to mind. Maybe a, some really tart uh, mandarin or orange. Um, in here, we're talking about fresh ripe fruit and peel and zest, really zingy. Uh, green apple and uh, green underripe pear and quince, the only tree type fruit I get. And again, those are fresh and just barely ripe. Uh, stone fruit, yes, uh, white peach predominantly, but also white and yellow nectarine. Again, fresh and ripe and it's that time of the year, perfect timing. Tropical fruit, if anything, some underripe mango, and that's about it. Condition of all that is fresh. Uh, and then if you pull your nose out of the glass, this has a little bit of apple blossoms and also citrus blossoms, like lime blossoms, and they are fresh. Okay, moving right along. All right, uh, no vegetables at all. Uh, I'm not so hot on the fennel anise call, a little bit of mushrooms, and I would tie that into the organic earth. Um, herbal, verbena works. Yeah, maybe chamomile, but none of the others, okay? Uh, other spices, eh, honey, but that's about it. Uh, you know, again, a little bit of inorganic earth in the form of mushroom, but really the main event here is, you know, mineral and rock. And yes, now we can bring that image back over front and center and TDN. In fact, TDN and sulfur, it's, uh, it's kind of screaming for attention. I'm pretty sensitive to sulfur. And uh, this is, you know, this is still showing a lot of SO2. Uh, and for those of you that are about to get dangerously excited, don't worry, it's okay. That's why at times you need to decant white wines. There are certain white wines where they use quite a bit of SO2, uh, you know, at the time of bottling, just as a preservative, and mainly because those wines are intended not for near-term consumption or hoovering or whatever you want to call it, but they're, you know, they're intended for you to put them in the cellar and then forget about them for a while. Okay, so yes, TDN and sulfur, no animals, no oak aging, uh, oxidation for me, none whatsoever. Chemical compounds, well, TDN is a chemical compound, so you can map it down there as well. Perceived winemaking choices, I think there's a little bit of Lee's contact here, but it's very secondary. And notice compared to the Verdicchio wine one is really not as, uh, doesn't have the impact. Okay, in terms of the, the palate and the structure, the wine is dry. The acid for me is high. Uh, the alcohol is medium. It's not very pronounced. Uh, phenols, I would say low. They are definitely there for me. I'm sensitive to those. The texture is lean and tart, uh, even though the wine, you know, the entry of the wine is fairly fruit forward, but it finishes clean and long and lean. Uh, the finish for me is long and the complexity is medium plus. So, uh, you know, knowing what you know about this wine now, this may not be such a difficult choice. Um, you know, in terms of Gewürztraminer, I, I would be looking for overt floral qualities, you know, like flower shop or the, the episode of Spongebob where they get trapped behind a perfume counter. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> for those who are paying attention. And, uh, and what else? Uh, just a lot more fruit, probably residual sugar and residual sugar, alcohol, right. less acid and botrytis and some phenolic bitterness. Has way too much information. Uh, Pinot Grigio, to me, semi-aromatic grape, and you know the best wines are from Alto Adige, 13% alcohol, uh, some phenolic bitterness, mineral, tart, bright, a little bit floral, okay? And then Riesling, of course, broad fruit expression, higher acid, and usually mineral driven, even if it's dry. All right. So I'm gonna end the poll right now and see what the results are. Uh, we have 67% with Riesling, 
Uh, but you kind of have a little bit of Gewürztraminer, Pinot Grigio, and other in there. So maybe it's worth explaining why it's not those things for sure from this okay. wine perspective. And then yeah. going yeah. with Riesling, you do still have French, Australia, and then of course an overwhelming Germany. All those places make Riesling. So if it is a Riesling, why would it be, you know, the place right. that it ends up? Right. Uh, well, let's go back to the grape varieties. You know, again, first of all, Gewürztraminer, fully aromatic grape, uh, really flamboyant, really floral, really spicy. And, and you know, classic examples, Alsace usually in and around 14% alcohol. So they are much richer wines. More often than not, they have residual sugar. They have a lot of phenolic bitterness. Uh, often they have botrytis, but they're very, very floral wines. They taste floral. Okay, so I'm gonna rule that out. Uh, if this was Pinot Grigio, it would be Pinot Grigio on 11 because Pinot Grigios aren't this intense. They're just not. Um, they're just more delicate wines. And, and that is not to say they can be really, really good because there are really good examples from Alto Um, All right, so if it is Riesling, where is it from? Okay, and that would be a challenge to figure out. You know, first of all, Australia, you know, with this kind of sulfur and TDN would be a good call. To me, the acid is not quite high enough and the wine is just not focused and linear enough. Uh, those wines are like liquid piano wire, for God's sake. Um, uh, old world France, if this was all such, you know, th there would be a darker earth quality and probably, you know, the wine would have a different texture. This wine to me strikes me and, you know, obviously we're going to tell you what it is in the moment and I know the winery pretty well. So this wine was done in stainless steel. Okay. Um, you know, all right. Rieslings by and large are done in old, big old wood and they have a much rounder, softer texture, if that's possible. Here we go. Wee. We're still in Europe and we're actually in Germany. Yeah, we're in the middle Mosul Valley. You see yeah. the Mosul right there. Yeah. yeah, and the tiny village of, of Lieser, which is to the right, and actually Brauderberg is where you see the church to the left. And uh, Schloss Lieser is a very historic property. I mean, uh, the Schloss. Um, what is now like a uh, five-star resort hotel, but uh, the, you know, Thomas Hogg, who is the, you know, older of the two sons of Willem Hogg, sadly, the late Willem Hogg, he passed away uh, last fall, mm -hmm. and I had the great pleasure of meeting him about four times, uh, you know, when I was in the Mosul, and Willem Hogg's winery was uh, Fritz Hogg, and certainly one of the great wineries in the middle Mosul, and so this 100% Riesling, this is uh, a Tronken wine. So this, you know, uh, Thomas Hogg at Schloss Lieser makes, you know, wines from about six different vineyards, very famous vineyards in the middle Mosul, including uh, Bernkastler Bern Doctor, uh, Veilander Zoniner, Gracher Himmerreich, you know, and those are Grand Cru type vineyards. This is a blend of uh, fruit from several of those sources. It's done in stainless steel. It is, you know, um, it's dry. And this is a very simple trocken cabinet. And cabinet, by the way, is the level of sugar in the grapes when they picked it. So these were grapes that were picked early in the season in 2016. Amazing that the color is held so well and the wine's almost five years old. Yeah. And that's German Riesling for you. Uh, notice the alcohol, 11.5. If this was a regular cabinet, that would probably be slightly sweet and the alcohol would be 9%. Uh, what else can we say about this? Uh, just it's it's a beautiful expression of, of Mosul Riesling that's dry and we in the last five to ten years we see a lot more dry wines than Mosul and it's a combination of climate change and just ripened fruit but also you know that everybody you know for the longest time you know in such a cooler climate was having trouble getting grapes ripe enough so that they can make good dry wines but I think they're there and that's Tomas on the left he's a fantastic guy and there's his family uh, great to know that his son and two daughters are both in the wine business, so they will continue as the next generations. You got to go to the next slide because the Schloss, when I first oh saw it, goodness. isn't it beautiful? <laughs> I think it was, I was um, there for the first time in, in the year 2000, and it was a wreck. It had been abandoned for about 30 years, and they bought it and, you know, obviously took on investors and sunk capital into it. And now it's like a destination in the Mosul, but it's a, a beautiful, beautiful site. And then you can see the vineyards going up behind it at about a 35 degree slope. And uh, yeah, the Mosul, one of my favorite wine places in the world. 
Okay. We have two questions here. Um, Margaret, I love your comment and the question about, is this wine flawed? Uh, I think Madeline, you were just kind of touching on it and Tim, you certainly touched on it. I want to be very open in this discussion. And I love the question, Margaret, because um, I sometimes worry that when we have a wine like this in our bottles with our rebottling process, Tim, that people think that we've, we've somehow created a flawed wine. So yeah. how do people enjoy this wine? How, do sh how should they think about it? You know, the, the burn of giving it more air, you know, to your point about decanting earlier. Um, I, I would love, Margaret, yeah. if you can ch in chat, kind of describe what you thought might be flawed. And then Tim, if you can just sort of talk about that, that overt sulfur. Yeah, you know, uh, Margaret, that's a good point. Um, um, you know, it, it, your response, I'm probably, I'm hazarding a guess that you're sensitive to sulfur like me. Uh, when I first opened this, I mean, it was like, it was like buying a new garden hose. <laughs> it was a little off-putting. But, you know, I, I have a lot of experience with German Riesling and this, you know, and knowing that if you pour this in the glass in 30 minutes, half of that goes away in an hour, most of it goes away. Or you can simply, you know, get a couple of decanters and decant it back and forth and then keep the, you know, the decanter with the wine chilled. Um, it will go away. But again, you know, the winery and this particular winery, Thomas Lieser, is really big on using quite a bit of sulfur at the time of bottling. And so, you know, some German wineries do, uh, it, especially JJ Prohm, you know? I mean, one of the best wineries in Germany, their sweet wines, especially, they use a lot of sulfur because they don't want you to drink them for at least 10 years. So uh, <laughs> this wine in particular, this wine just needs some air. Uh, this might be one of those times, dare I say it, and I hate to say it, where you might, you might consider using one of those cursed air. Oh, no, drinks. no. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, would never, I would never even entertain using one of those because I think they're completely bogus. It's just my opinion, because that's why you have decanters, for God's sake. Right. You know? Or you could just let and it air out. Me, in that's, glass. It, that's just photoshopping wine. Sorry. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Wine number three. Uh, Tim, I am going to turn to you on the visual because it's getting even darker here. Okay. And, yeah, uh, and, and for those of you who joined us late, wine. Madeline is literally sitting in the dark. And so thank you, Madeline, for, for hanging in there. Patty, I hope you're keep, keeping cool. That's the important thing. All right, so I'll do the-, the This is too much the, fun, I'm, I, you know, yeah. Okay, so the, the color, this is uh, star bright. So it's got more color and it reflects less light, hence not as bright as the Riesling we just tasted. Uh, it is clear. I would say the depth of color is medium, maybe medium plus. It is yellow and straw and uh, highlights are green. And actually I have a few bubbles, but that is neither here nor there. Sometimes uh, wineries add CO2 when they bottle yeah. for a preservative. So who knows? Bubbles, not a big deal. Unless of course it's champagne and then it's important. Take it away, Maddie. <laughs> Okie doke. So uh, again, I'm gonna speak to it both aromatically and on the palate, when I put my nose in the glass, you know, I get a combination of the citrus fruit we see right up front, um, that lemon, Meyer lemon, you know, um, Mandarin, but also right beneath it, uh, kind of melted into it, a little bit of oak, not uh, dominant, but there's a classic oak fragrance of uh, vanilla and some general baking spices. It doesn't command your attention, but it's melted into the citrus. Um, if you uh, flip down to the tree fruit, especially when you have it on the palate, it's interesting if you look at the description here, and I agree with it 100%, the apple is more yellow than, say, green, and we're not getting precious. You know, if you think of broad strokes, there's green apple and then there's yellow red, right? Um, certainly fresh and ripe, not cooked. And then again, um, more of a brown bosk pear character, as opposed to, you know, a green unripe uh, pear. So tree fruit, but strong citrus fruit character. The stone fruit for me is not um, really speaking up at this tasting. It's kind of a back flavor, a um, little bit of peach. Tropical fruit, ditto. Maybe a little bit of banana in there, but I'm reaching. And to that point, when we speak to the wine, we are tasting with you in real time. So we're not talking to some theoretical concept and... and we're not, you know, uh, married to this grid. We are using it to reflect 
how we feel about the wine uh, tasting it right now. Floral, there's a little bit of um, apple blossom to it, but it's definitely a side note. And then let's go to the, um, the second slide. I have to tell you the aroma on this wine is just completely seductive to me. I love that combination of citrus and um, vanilla and oak melted into one another, but I'm not smelling alcohol and I'm not smelling strong baking spice, which sometimes you can get from, um, from oak. Did we flip to the next slide? I can't tell. I'm gonna go ahead yeah. and- Yeah, you are. It. Ah, yes, we did. So green bag, yep, uh, Zippo for me. Um, other vegetable, maybe a little corn, maybe a little white mushrooms. Uh, again, it's a tertiary uh, note, it's, you know, down the way. Other spices are very much um, sort of uh, a reflection of the oak, the subtle oak presence. Ginger, I consider that a sweet baking spice. Uh, uh, sesame candy, I love that one. Um, go down to organic and inorganic herbs. Little reflection of the mushroom again, but it's not a big element in this one. Um, go down to oak aging, yes, but I completely agree with this. Medium, verging on subtle. You know, it's not, it's a, it's, um, it's integrated. And we, we, we use that word with, you know, um, some uh, passions and it's melted into it, just like using exactly the right amount of salt. So you don't think salt. There's the oak influence, which at this tasting to me is expressing itself a little bit sweeter, like vanilla and maybe caramel toffee, as opposed to the strong spice elements. Oxidation, nuttiness, sure. Um, from um, the winemaking process, but just a touch and absolutely appropriate. And I like the first one, hazelnut for sure. Perceived winemaking choice, uh, least contact. Yes, as to the richness, Mao, uh, it isn't screaming it. And you know, interestingly uh, on the tech sheet with this wine, they don't talk about it. So momentarily, I'm gonna turn to Tim who might say it smells like buttered popcorn to him, but it does not to me. So. Back to this wine, aromatically, it's more forward. The palate is a little bit more backward. Aromatically, it's lush uh, with that combination of citrus fruit and oak on the palate. Um, actually quite mouthwatering, acidity and sleek. The finish is actually slightly short because I think the wine is young. So looking at the structure, dry for sure. Acidity medium plus for sure, inching into high. Um, alcohol medium plus, but it works. It's not pulling your attention, nor is it an element that's interfering with the other aspects of the wine. Uh, no phenolic uh, expression, I agree with that. Round and smooth, it's gonna be round and smooth. At the moment, it's coming off slightly tart because of the acidity, but sure. Finish is long uh, texturally, but the flavors um, are, are working to keep up with the nose. I think it leads a little bit more bottle edge, but it's a a beautiful polished uh, wine. You can tell that the fruit, so fruit source is impeccable and uh, the quality of oak they're using ain't cheap as the saying uh, goes. Broad strokes. You've got Chardonnay, which is uh, a non-aromatic variety. It takes a lot of its character from um, how it's made and where it's grown. Uh, Viognier and Sauvignon Blanc are both highly aromatic grape varieties. Viognier usually have an, having an expression of uh, flowers that is absolutely distinct, but slightly less, dare I say it, obnoxious <laughs> than Gewürztraminer. It's not like, um, you know, perfume all the time. Sauvignon Blanc, this is interesting. Sauvignon Blanc slash blend. So hold that thought. You know, is it uh, a mono varietal or has it been blended with its... Um, you know, it's kissing cousin Semillon and hasn't been put in oak, which we're definitely perceiving. So all three of these options can absolutely be barrel fermented and or uh, barrel aged. And if Sauvignon Blanc um, has been blended with a significant amount of Semillon and added to a barrel, uh, you know, it's going to cut down on that forward uh, compelling um, grapefruit and grassy element. And then, you know, you want to consider We've got Old World in the incarnation of France and Italy, New World in Australia and California. So did we speak to any inorganic um, or organic earth element? Um, you know, I didn't pick it up much in the swine, maybe a little bit of inorganic minerality, um, but it certainly wasn't something that um, uh, I had to pay attention to. 
So going on to Google this, Earth. This is my favorite part. Thank you for doing this, Andrea. Yay, here we go to California. So we're, we're in the new world in California. Mm -hmm. And here we are. And for those of you who don't know, Sebastopol that's listed on there, that is in Sonoma County. Uh, this, uh, this is the Cross Barn Winery, actually, that is um, owned and operated by the family of, um, you know, Paul Hobbs Wines. And um, the appellation for this specific wine um, is actually Sonoma Coast. However, we are momentarily going to see a picture of uh, the winery itself, which is a cross barn, um, very much inspired by uh, Paul Hobbs's heritage of uh, growing up on a farm in Northern New York State. I tried to look up the difference between a barn, barn and a cross barn, but I ran out of time. So maybe one of you can um, use your internet source to do that. The um, grape source actually sources for this wine come from within the Sonoma Coast. So this is not um, a Yudi, it's not a single site. And the Sonoma Coast, you know, is a relatively long um, Appalachian from north to south, pushing up against Mendocino um, and uh, down to uh, the Petaluma Gap, and it encompasses what? Freestone, Annapolis, uh, Fort Ross. Um, mm -hmm. But the punchline in terms of the Appalachian is the um, dominating influence of the Pacific, with, you know, not just Pacific breezes, cold winds coming in um, that really uh, moderate or, you know, definitely uh, change the growing season for the, um, the grapes grown in this area. Um, I like the statistic um, that uh, evenings can dip into the 40s um, and daytime highs are typically in the low 70s. So we're not soaring, but we have a pretty significant um, diurnal switch between daytime and nighttime temperatures. So Paul Hobbs actually launched his namesake winery, Paul Hobbs in 1991, um, but started uh, Cross Barn in uh, 2000, almost 10 years after that. This is, by the way, a 19. I wouldn't agonize between 19 and 20. It's young. Uh, it comes across quite young to me, especially on the palate. And um, he started this um, ironically and touchingly in a formal apple processing facility in Sebastopol, which is so he intentionally looked for a place that would uh, mirror the spirit of his um, family's start in um, northern um, New York State. This is, uh, in terms of winemaking uh, regime, it is whole cluster pressed. It is 100% stainless steel fermented. Though if you look at their website, they will claim partial barrel fermentation. And I love that because what websites say, what tech sheets say, and what they actually do aren't all necessarily exactly the same thing, which is why we have to talk, trust our palate. Um, five months on the lees, um, modest oak, but they don't claim the amount in terms of percentage, nor um, the percentage of uh, new versus uh, used barrels. I would. Um, you know, project and say there's at least a percentage of new French oak on this and that probably all of the barrels are smaller because the um, aromatically, the expression of oak is distinct, though, again, it's not um, compelling. You know, overview wise, I think this is a beautiful Chardonnay, a great example of cool climate, new world Chardonnay. Um, I think it would be not difficult to deduce that is new world versus old world, though certainly some white burgundies have this much oak um, on the nose, but there, you know, that absence of minerality on the palate speaks to the new world. And then you ask yourself, where in the new world makes this quality of Chardonnay um, with this kind of acidity and moderate alcohol? I mean, Western Australia might um, occur to you as well. I think if you went to the South Central or South Central Coast, you would get, in my opinion, um, especially the central coast, maybe more tropical elements and the south central coast, um, probably higher levels of alcohol, even though you have uh, elevated levels of um, acidity. So this wine to me is lush on the nose, tart on the palate, and a beautiful example of a cool climate Cali Chardonnay. And everybody, you know, just, it, you know, first of all, what a pretty color, but this is definitely not a thicker skin 
heavy pigmented gray variety. Yeah, keep that in mind. It's star bright, it is clear. It's a very pretty ruby red color with a pink rim, fairly youthful. Yep, uh, no staining in the tears. And then on the nose, I've spelled this many times over the last hour. If you combined a bean cherry cola with a Psalm tea and heirloom rose, that's what this smells like. It's got a wonderful nose. So dominantly red fruit, I would say sour red cherry and strawberry and cranberry, all that nails it. Red plum, okay, fresh and ripe. No blue fruit. Uh, the black fruit here is black cherry and that's about it for me. And again, condition is fresh. There is a little bit of orange, like orange peel that you would find in, uh, what's that tea? Constant comment tea, right? So there's a little, you know, sweet orange peel. Uh, no stone fruit and floral, yes, this smells like roses. Um, uh, just lovely and the condition is fresh, okay. Mm. And then there's a lot in the other category in terms of green things and savory things. So I would say there's definitely leafy greens, uh, green olives, great call. Mushroom, yes. Fennel and anise, absolutely. And rhubarb, you know, something that's sour and red to me, more fruit than vegetable, but it looks like celery. Uh, tea leaf, definitely black tea. It says bergamot, not too much for me, but this smells like really good Assam tea. Um, basil and I like chicory. Uh, sassafras and uh, some red licorice, yeah, and paprika, pimenton, good call. There is some of, there's some of an earthy quality, uh, but I wouldn't call it profound, okay? And you guys, you can always cheat. You can always pick up one of the other glasses and smell it, like pick up glass five, for instance, and smell it compared to this to get a reality check on earthiness. And then you come back to four and you go, oh, it's not very earthy at all. Good. Okay. Um, that's why that's how we set up these flights of wine, you know. Uh, no animals were seen uh, while making this wine. Oak aging is low in terms of its impact. And here, use barrique at the very most, maybe larger barrels. There's a slight smokiness and toastiness and very slight spice. And oxidation, walnut, good call. No chemical compounds. Perceived, perceived winemaking choice as well by its very definition, this probably has partial whole cluster, which means it could mean some stems that were used, probably. That's my sense in terms of the way it tastes. Okay, structure. It's fermented dry. Uh, acid for me is medium plus. And alcohol medium plus, tannin medium. Yeah, and that's important. Think about lighter color and medium in a red wine for tannins. The texture is round and smooth. And I know this is a silly term, but this wine is very pretty. And what, by the term, I mean that, I mean, it's just gently fruit forward and soft and completely structured on the palate. And that's a really good descriptor for it. The finish is long to me and the complexity is medium plus. Okay. Gamma, you know, a classic example would be Beaujolais Village, in which case we're looking for carbonic maceration and stem inclusion. And also a pretty, you know, even for a, you know, a, a, a lighter scaled wine, you're gonna have a sense of earthiness and uh, especially minerality, okay? Uh, Barbera, you know, Italian red grape, high acid, yeah? And some grape tannin, even in, the, even in the ones that are done in rotary fermenters or they use whole cluster. And Barbera is made in a lot of different styles, okay? Uh, and then, of course, Pinot Noir. So you and the grape varieties, uh, Gamay, you know, for this, there's no carbonic and stem inclusion. I mean, for me, that's off the table. Barbera, to me, first of all, if it is from Italy, and a classic example would be, it would be earthy, it would be more acidic and more tannic. So uh, that leaves Pinot Noir. And then the question is, is, okay, so where is it from? And your two options for that, that would make sense well, three options, you know, thinking France and Burgundy in a lower scale Burgundy, but there's no earthiness whatsoever, right? Or not much at all, uh, which leaves New Zealand and it leaves Oregon. And for Oregon Pinot, I want much more fruit than this. Uh, I like all the herbal qualities for it, but there should be a lot more fruit. There should be a lot more uh, to it. And that leaves New Zealand. And New Zealand to me are the most herbal Pinot Noirs. And if we could go back to a couple of slides and remember all those herbal and vegetal things that we were talking about. And that to me, that's that secondary savory, all, that, all those qualities is New Zealand. So let's see what it is.
I like your deductive process, Tim. It almost makes it sound easy. And for the rest of you who does, <laughs> for whom it's not that easy, you know, it was not easy for me. No, no, hey, no. One look at the label is worth a lot no, of money. Babe, it took, how many years did it take to get it easy? A long time. Okay. There you go. There we go. So we are in uh, Marlboro, South Island, New Zealand. And this is Villa Maria. Uh, this winery is celebrating the 60 years this year. 1961, uh, George Pistonich, you know, started the winery by, you know, buying an acres worth of grapes from his dad and making it in his garage. And then over, you know, the years expanding the winery, uh, they now have over 250 people on staff in New Zealand and worldwide. And uh, 28 different grape varieties and they export to 60 countries. Villa Maria to me is, um, you know, just such a reliable name for New Zealand wine. And uh, to me, these, you know, these private bins uh, are always just really high quality and unmistakably varietal. And you think about the price of this, you know, the Pinot Noir this good for 17, 18 bucks is unheard of. Yeah, I mean, you just don't find it. And that's the current winemaker, Nick Picone, very talented guy. And uh, yeah, I, I especially like the Rieslings from Villa Maria too. They're lovely and they make really good Pinot Gris too. Actually looked at this wine and can even see it in my semi-dark room. So I am gonna speak to the visual on it. To Tim's point, if you put your finger underneath wine number five, um, you can see through it. You can't read through it, but can you can see through it. And what's very interesting to me, I love this, is the center is a relatively dark ruby. And if you move your eye from the center to the rim, you're going to run into three, four, even five bands of different hues, not just lightning, but different colors, ending up with, you know, uh, in my little dark room, it's uh, yellow, AKA orange, I'm not really sure. But I wanna mention to everyone, this is where color really comes into play. Don't gasp to, to make a, um, a conclusion, but hold the thought that when you see that gradation of color, it can speak to specific grape varieties and or bottle age. So hold that thought. Um, I think I did that pretty completely, don't you, Tim, even in the dark? Yeah, absolutely. Yay. <laughs> yeah, that's impressive. Um, so, um, again, speaking to both the nose and the palate, and I'll try to power through this, Lee Mang. I don't know what time it is because I'm afraid to look at the time on my phone, but I think um, we're, uh, we're doing Come okay. Um, we're good. The, um, aromatically, the first thing is um, uh, the quality and complexity sings in this wine right up front. And what I mean by complexity, even before going through the grid, I get struck by a combination of fruit, earth, and flowers, and um, venosity, which is the opposite of uh, grapiness. So again, hold that thought. You've got a wine that's um, aromatically showing um, uh, levels, uh, even in what I think is its use. So go back to, and by the way, Li Mang, my phone is running low, so I may not be able to join you on wine number six, but I'm gonna power through wine number five because I can't plug it in. So certainly red fruit, red currant, red sour cherry, red plum, and an interesting combination of fresh and raisinated or actually dried, I would say. I'm from Michigan. Dried cherries, baby. This is where, you know, the best ones in the world are. Um, black fruit, a little bit of black cherry and black plum. Again, a combination of fresh, ripe, and dried. Um, skip on down to floral. To me, this is very much a dried expression of flowers, like potpourri. And let's go on to the next panel before I disappear. I would say um, other veg, maybe a little bit of fennel anise and sun-dried uh, tomatoes dried herbs um, and actually um, dried, uh, you know, it, it, I would expand on other spices. I find some exotic um, Indian spices in the aromatics of the swine like cardamom and such. Uh, go back to herbal, definitely a little tea leaf for sure. Um, or big um, player for me here. And I would translate the turn dirt and clay to dust. There's a dustiness to the aromatics of the swine. Um, there were animals, you know, in the presence of the winery um, <laughs> when the swine was made. 
Oh, when we talk about blood, we talk about a little bit of um, iron character, like when you prick your finger and you suck on it, that character. Maybe a touch of leather, but definitely not overt retinomyces. Oak aging, yes, but very low intensity. Undoubtedly old oak. Oh my God, you may see me momentarily. I think my light's coming on. Um, so large neutral oak is a probability. Um, oxidation nuttiness, yes, a hint. Uh, chemical compounds, VA is noted here. I have to be honest with you. I am not VA sensitive. I think because I'm old enough that when I started tasting it and it was wildly present in wines, it was never pointed out to me. So momentarily, Tim can weigh in on that. But this wine to me is complex, earthy, dried fruit, um, and dried flowers. And on the palate, uh, definitely dry. Acidity is medium plus. Um, but what's very interesting, play close attention to the mouthfeel. It's almost equal to the tannins that are medium also, maybe medium plus, but refined. So you have this fabulous tension between acidity and tannin. Alcohol, balance, so medium. Gritty astringent, but not terribly astringent. You know, I would actually edit this a little bit to say maybe lean, uh, but we talked about that, the acid and the tannin in balance and the quality of the tannins. The finish is long. And I don't think this wine has significant bottle age, but it has some. It wasn't born yesterday. Complexity, high to very high. Can you tell I really like this wine? Okay. What options do we have on grape varieties? Uh, Nebbio, run the poll. Mm -hmm. Yep. Nebbio, run the poll. Nebbiolo Sangiovese blend, Cabernet Franc blend. We kind of have to do that because often these grape varieties are blended with others. I will tell you when you are wrestling, as countless people have and will continue to between Nebbiolo and Sangiovese, notably because both of them will show that gradation of color in their youth, go to the mouthfeel, go to the quality of the tannin. And if you are being shown a Nebbiolo in, um, a, uh, from a source that you trust and you can rely on, um, it will inevitably be harder, more drying, more unforgiving than the, um, the tannin in Sangiovese, which certainly isn't Namby Pamby, particularly in a Brunello di Montalcino. Consider Cabernet Franc. And now, first of all, if you're in the new world with Cab Franc, you may have um, opaque color right? But even if you're in the old world, if you're in the Loire and the color is not opaque, go to the aroma of Franc. What will you get? You will get green um, elements, pyrazine, that are simply not present in either Nebbiolo or Sangiovese. I like to reduce it uh, to simple elements, not because I'm dumbing it down, because quite often, you know, there is a clarity and a simplicity to deduction that, you know, we get lost in the minutia and the forest of the options. Uh, so try to force yourself to be a little bit um, more directed and simple. Uh, what regions? Old world, Italy, Portugal, and talking about, um, well, I don't know where Portugal's coming into play with Nebbiolo and Sangiovese, but um, certainly Italy, New World, Australia, and uh, California with Cab Franc. You could subtext even add um, um, Argentina in there that's doing a killer uh, job with, um, with Cab Franc. So that said, are Let we going turn. to so you're part around? Oh, here we go. Yes, the poll. Okay. I hope your AC came back on. So um, <laughs> <laughs> we're at 40% Sangiovese mm -hmm. and then split kind of half and half Nebbiolo and Cabernet Franc. Mm -hmm. But if you add up the two Italian more varieties, mm -hmm. you're at about 75%. Nebbiolo and Sangiovese. So maybe I really want to. I really want to nudge people. Uh, you know, nobody can force you to do anything. There is no wine police. But I want to hear when we reveal this wine, what specifically led you to Cab Franc, uh, because that will be very useful both to me and to the uh, other folks who are blind tasting. Cool. Great. Great. So uh, we're at seventy-five percent Italy. So let's see if folks are right. Mm -hmm. Let's go on Google Earth and let's see if we go back on to we, Europe. Uh, we're definitely never in Africa. We start in Africa and here we are. Um, we are going to Italy. We are going to Tuscany. We are going inland. We're going to Coldurcia. We are in Montalcino. Um, this is one of the um, 
oldest producers of uh, Brunello. Um, and they are, for whatever it's worth, 100% uh, uh, organic, um, not just for their grape production, but for their olives, their wildfire honey, um, wildflower honey and such. Um, so this is, if we can reveal the wine, um, actually not a Brunello, it is Rosso di Montalcino, uh, sort of, you know, not very respectfully, but uh, routinely called um, baby Brunello because it's often made from younger vines, though it's sometimes, uh, uh, you know, maybe a, not a, so much a downgrade, but a declassification when they're putting together the, the cuvées of maybe lots that are more concentrated. It has some bottle age, it's a 2016, which helps explain why I think we have such a generous complexity on the nose of this quote unquote little wine. You know, Rosa de Montalcino is not lesser than Brunello. It is certainly less expensive than Brunello. And it's often an entry into an exceptional producer at an accessible um, price point. This is the largest um, certified organic estate in Tuscany. It is called Coldorcia. Um, the hill overlooking the Orchia River. And I made a point of looking this up on a map. It is in the southern portion of Montalcino. For those of you who are studying at a refined level and want to know <laughs> if it's in the north or the south, you have significant altitude here. You're 1,500 feet above sea level. So that helps preserve Sangiovese, a.k.a. Brunello, um, that uh, expression of Sangiovese's natural acidity. The I will bet money that their Brunello actually sees a little new oak. Um, this is all older Slavonian oak casts and they're large. Um, I think it's just a gorgeous example of Sangiovese. You can memorize that nose and, you know, take it forward into the future with you when you are blind tasting. This is the very handsome Count Francesco Madone Cinzano. And one can imagine the Cinzano um, uh, resources came into play in uh, acquiring this estate. I have to tell you on the website, you should check it out. It's There's a gorgeous picture of him drinking a little Brunello with a cigar in his left hand. So, so hold that thought. And oh, the yeah. next slide, have you seen that? It's just, but you, one would imagine that. There is yep. um, the original uh, estate. Um, and then the next slide too, it, which undoubtedly has been, um, you know, refurbished. Uh, this to me is, you know, um, if, if you can call anything typical about Tuscany, it's actually typical hillside Tuscany, because when you're at a lower altitude, um, and if you've been there, you're driving through, you know, forested areas. Um, whereas here, you definitely get a sense of being a little bit higher up. Um, I think it's a beautiful example of Sangiovese. And if you're wrestling with G is it Brunello, G is it uh, Rosso di Montepulciano, D G is it Chianti Classico, uh, Reserva, et cetera. If you're having that problem, you are having a very good day. Um, Tim, would you agree <laughs> with that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there's also, again, there are things that should take you to all those places. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I tasted these wines, uh, when was I there, in 2012. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, this is a uh, cold orcha is is on the side, like you said, it's in the south, but it's fairly elevated, but the soil there in the north. Well, let me stop for a second. So Brunello and by extension Rosso is really the Burgundy of Sangiovese. And I say that because it's, you know, Brunello is 100% Sangiovese. And if you if you compare that to Chianti Classico or Vino Nobile di Montepulciano, more often than not, those have other grapes added in. Brunello, and this wine, by the way, is 100% Sangiovese too. So it's not a blend. Right. Um, you know, the, uh, it's just that by the time you get Brunello, it's the oldest out of all those wines. So it's gonna be the most oxidative. Even Rosso, and this is declassified Brunello because I know the wines from the estate, um, you know, 100% Sangiovese Grosso, and you know, it, it supposedly is aged for a year, but this particular estate ages theirs for between two and three years before release. Um, and Madeline, you did a brilliant job just nailing the description. This wine is so aromatically complex, it's off the charts. And for only $24 retail, it's just an unheard of Absurd. value. Absurd. Unbelievable. Right. Now, I'm going to comment real quickly on Becky's comment, she says, between Sangi Sangiovese and Nebbiolo, I find Nebbiolo finishes with tannins, Sangiovese with acidity. Becky, for me, Nebbiolo just has more of both. 
right? Mm -hmm. And it also tends to be more austere and it's much more floral. Uh, this wine to me has more fruit in the front and it's not quite as tannic. Brunello would be more tannic, but also more oxidative and more oaky. That's a good call. Okay. And lovely, Sangiovese mm -hmm. is my second favorite red grape behind Pinot Noir. And this is a great example why. And I think the New York Times calls Montalcino one of the most expensive wine real estates in the world, if not the most expensive. Just Montalcino well, and its surrounding areas. Yeah, I have to tell you, the, it's a really, it's a small uh, medieval hilltop town, just like Montepulciano, but it's got a lot of expensive restaurants and more wine shops per square foot than <laughs> I've seen anywhere. Mm -hmm. And the wines mm -hmm. you would think would be less expensive than they are here. They're not. They're just as yeah. expensive. But you know, another, another reason when people are learning to blind taste and you're, you know, you're stuck on at least nailing the grape variety, a wine like this, a great Rosso de Montalcino, I mean, a Rosso de Montalcino from a great producer is an accessible way, you know. Yeah. Um, God, this is to so good. Yeah. yeah. Great. All right. Last wine, guys. We got to get to the finish line here. Uh, right. Wine number I six, Tim, you're up. Yeah. Now for something completely different. Look at the color. <laughs> so useful. Yeah. Uh, this has a little uh, bluish purple tinge in it. So we're going to call it ruby you know, with a dark fuchsia magenta rim, uh, pretty densely colored. So higher pigmented red grape perhaps. And there is actually some staining the tears. Okay, on the nose and the palate. Mm. All right, so the fruit is a mix of different kinds. There is red fruit and black fruit and even a little bit of blue fruit too. So red fruit, I'm going with sour cherry and raspberry fresh and ripe, blue fruit to me, blueberry, definitely fresh and ripe. Uh, black raspberry and blackberry in terms of black fruit, what, what lifted with acidity, fresh and ripe, no citrus fruit, no stone fruit. And then nose above the glass, the wine's quite floral. And here I like violet more than anything, but uh, fresh. All right, next slide, please. All right, so like the previous wine, this has a lot of other savory type category. Uh, I like dark leafy greens. I like red peppers. I like mushrooms, fennel and anise, very strong. Tea leaf, pretty strong. Uh, laurel, this, this smells like California Bay laurel to me. Uh, black pepper, definitely. Hmm, that's important to keep in mind. Also green peppercorn, Piemontan again. And then there is some forest floor, mushroom, et cetera, et cetera. And a little bit of mineral and rock. I think there is yeah, a tiny bit of animal to me, but really not much. To me, this is very clean, well-made wine. And that is not to say the previous wine, which Madeline said had both a tiny bit of Britannomyces and VA was just fabulous, okay? So context is important. If one of those tends to dominate a wine, it's flawed, but more often than not, and in the case of you know, Montalcino, it's part of how the wine has historically been made, okay. Uh, oxidation, nuttiness, no. Blended oak, used oak, it's best. Oak is really a secondary play, uh, player here. Uh, no chemical compounds. And yes, from the color alone, I would suspect partial, partial whole cluster and stem inclusion. And I say that simply because of the purplish hue, uh, you know, that it may get from whole cluster. Okay, moving to the structure. It is dry, medium plus acidity. Medium plus alcohol, medium plus tannin, a medium plus wine. Gritty and astringent, mm, not for me so much, but uh, for me, I thought it actually finished fairly polished. And this is where context is really important because compare it to the wine we just tasted, which was more acidic and more tannic. So this wine comes off smooth. Yes. All right. So uh, complexity, medium plus. All right. That's a mouthful. So let's see what uh, our possibilities are on the ballot. So uh, we've got two out of the three listed possibilities are Cabernet Sauvignon family grapes. And especially with Carmenere from Chile, I would be looking for some serious uh, pyrazines, serious. <laughs> like, you know, uh, you know, electric, you know, green bell pepper and green peppercorns, okay? And then with Malbec, also Cabernet Sauvignon, Malbec tends to be the least pyrazinic out of all the Cabernet family grapes. 
Um, you know, but Cabernet family, I would expect a little bit of tannin. And then Syrah, of course, Syrah is uneven ripening. So you get a broad range of fruit, but you also get pepper. You get uh, a lot of savory secondary type notes. And, uh, you know, everything from, you know, in some cases, bacon and spice, you know, uh, smoked meat, on and on and on and on. So a lot. Malbec, wouldn't you say, if I can chime in, also tends to have um, uh, a defined floral character. You know, you definitely yeah, pick up call. flowers on the nose. And, yeah, um, you know, uh, also the, the color is, you know, opaque. So that comes into play yeah. uh, possibly in this wine. This is a wine that's near and dear to our hearts. And we have a personal association with this. Yeah. Yes. yes. All right, so this is Echolands, and this is Washington State, Walla Walla. This is the Le Colline vineyard. Le Colline translates as the foothills. This is probably, oh, arguably, you know, it's 290 acres, so it's a big vineyard, but it's arguably, you know, one of the top five vineyards in Washington State. Uh, they supply fruit to over 40 wineries. Uh, our good buddy, uh, Greg Harrington, who owns Gramercy Cellars, he, he, this, he said this is the reason why he started making wine and moved to Washington. Was He had tasted something from this vineyard. Uh, but Echolands is co-owned by our dear and uh, wild and crazy friend, Doug Frost, <laughs> master sommelier, master of wine. And, the first, uh, he was the first to have both uh, designations, I think. I thought that Ron was. Ron oh, Miguel. you know what? I stand corrected. Yeah, but, but he was but, you the know, first, you know. Yeah, Doug is the but more cheerful also, of the two. Mm -hmm. He but, also pursued the two titles at the same time, which is mm -hmm. crazy. Uh, here we are. We're in uh, eastern Washington. Uh, and you can see it's like, uh, it's, you know, Lake Helene is probably five, seven miles from the Oregon border. So um, elevation, it's about 1,100 feet. The soil there is a base rock of ancient basalt, volcanic basalt, but then there are river stones. So there's gravel and river stones on top. So it drains really well. And a lot of different grape varieties made there, but this is to me, this is just beautiful example of Washington State Syrah. And who, who you know, Madeline and I were talking about this. We, you know, we've known Doug for 30 plus years and never did I entertain him wanting to make wine. So when he told us he was doing this, I was shocked, gobsmacked, as they say. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. He also right. makes a really glorious um, uh, Bordeaux style blend if you get your hands yeah. on it. Um, if I can jump in before my phone dies, sure. Tim, I wanted to say, yeah. you know, you may have to do the swine deductively because there's Doug, by the way, on the left with his wild and crazy look on his That's face. Doug Yay, punching down. Expression. Yeah. Um, you know, you're not getting overt smoke and you're not getting overt pepper on the swine, which is yeah. two of the things that we cling to in blind tasting, yeah. being able to identify a Syrah, which may shove you into the Northern Rhone, um, gasping with gratitude if you pick it up. And there's not an overt meatiness to it either. So that said, the first thing Tim, Tim said, that combination of, of red, black, with even a little bit of blue fruit. So um, that and the fact that the alcohol peaks a little bit will lead you away from um, the old world and the fact that there's no you know overt earthiness to this wine but I would have to do this wine deductively if that makes you feel better yeah. if you're going Jizo Pete yeah. Syrah thank you I also think you know Madeline we talked about this earlier that the nose is not as generous as the palate mm -hmm. you know for me this in a blind tasting this mm -hmm. would be a struggle um Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, this from the fruit and the structure and the palate feel, it's almost like Malbec, a really good Malbec, but it's yeah. got too many other secondary things and it's mm -hmm. got pepper. So, on the palate, uh, right. Point, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But yeah. aromatically, it's not nearly as forthcoming as the palate. Thank you for bringing no. that up because we were talking yeah. about that, right? I just want to say thank you again to everyone for you know, staying with us, Madeline, for being a huge team player and trooper, <laughs> uh, doing this in the dark for 90% and then powering through on your phone. And for everybody else, thank you for just letting us work through our technical difficulties 